Okay? So I am Brent Gora, and I am the general manager for Intel's high performance data division. I just realized I did not put that on the slide. I apologize. The paint is still a little bit wet at Intel for us. Um, I started a company about two and a half years ago called LandCloud, and we took the mustard tree and ran with it and basically kept it, in, in my words here, kept it relevant to the high performance computing community. And in July of last year, Intel purchased us. And as you might imagine, Intel's a very large company with 100,000 employees. And I've spent the last six months trying to find the restroom down the hall, which I still can't do it. The fact that I work at home is a real embarrassment on top of that. So I want to talk a little bit about the, what we see as the future of network-based storage, give you some background, what's driving all this, what's our thoughts, our activities on in the R&D space. So I'm an old HPC guy, and what you learn after being in HPC for a while is that HPC breaks everything over time, because we're always pushing the edge of the world, the edge of technology. Something is always breaking at the high end of HPC. I worked at once living in the last for about 20 years. Another piece of that is that storage is a bottleneck and it's considered a tax on the, on the computational portion of your data center. What we really want is swaps delivered to the applications. Storage is considered a tax on your compute. Mark Seeger, I worked for at Once Livermore, he would literally tell the storage companies, You'll, you are taking money away from flops that I want to deliver to my sons. And the interesting thing here, well, Mark Seeger went into as well, heard about it, but the interesting thing here is when we designed big HPC systems at Livermore, the size of the I.O. was scaled to the, the requirement for checkpoint restart. So let me, let me illustrate by example. I was an architect on the Blue Gene Q system, which is at Livermore. It's about four and a half million cores. When we designed that system, the MTBF was seven days. Okay, so at the leading edge, you expect with that many components, just the hardware failure rate, you're going to crash the machine on the order of once every seven days. So there's a certain probability associated with that, and thus you want to do checkpoint restart to save the state of your program up, up to that point in time. Well, we were willing to pay a 10% tax for that, um, the checkpoint restart IO. So you take a look at how much of, when you do a checkpoint, the machine is idle, okay? So we've got a machine that's worth upwards of $150 million, and it's sitting there idle, sucking down all the electricity, basically being a space heater, not moving the application forward. So we were willing to spend 10% of that system time to do the I.O. If you check into the RPs that we published, there's actually an equation in there that the, the uh, the vendors had to respond with the failure rate of the machine and scale the I.O. appropriately so that we would only spend 10% of the time doing the I.O., the, the defensive I.O. And of course, people generally ignore the storage because of its tax. Memory gets all the glory. Of course, Simon has this, this seminal paper called the, the Memory Wall that was back in about 2000 was very popular. The next speaker is talking about how to, how to get better memory efficiency out of your system. For those of you young in the room, back when I started doing HPC, you could actually do two reads and a write for every clock cycle on your system. So the, us old guys are looking at the distance of memory and saying that it's basically wasting the CPU cycles. And so we use various technologies to try to bring it back as best we can. And it's not just run Linpad. Linpad's taking a bit of a hit lately. But the bottom line is that the I.O. really matters to the users. You have to persist the state of your application. The data that you've read in a process, you want to be able to put it somewhere so you can do something with it, be it checkpoint or application I.O. itself. So a standard disclaimer here, these are my ideas, not Intel's. The Intel has a whole host of different slides you can pick up with two-point font on them for this sort of thing. And I want to talk a little bit about Luster and the LAMCloud business. 
Lustre is the dominant file system technology used in high performance computing. If you look at all the reports, it's somewhere around 23% of HPC uses Lustre. WAM Cloud was an important action in this time frame because we kept the Lustre technology relevant and available to HPC. Now, the, the purchase of WAM Cloud by Intel has caused a little bit of ripples in the universe because people are wondering what Intel is up to here. And I'm here to say that we are a separate business unit with Inside Intel, and we do exactly what we did before. We do the lion's share of the development on the Lustre tree. We do it in a way that's multi-vendor, that is not dependent on any architecture, not Intel architecture, not EMC architecture, none of that. The Lustre tree is pure and completely open source. We've had staff retention of 98%, and it, it's kind of funny, we've only lost one person who was a project manager, but we've got an incredibly tight and dedicated team. Lustre's ordering on religion to many people, right? And I guess I could count myself in that too, since I was a customer. It's like that shaving commercial. I liked the razor so much I bought the company. And then went and sold it to Intel, so it looked out quite well. Intel took over and supports every single contract that we did at Wayne Cloud, including the fast forward contract. And why that's interesting is because as a small company, when you win a US DOE contract, you get to keep the IP for reuse in other areas if you care to. When a big company is in that same position, the DOE requires a 40% cost share. So on an $8 million contract, Intel had to dig into their pockets and add several million dollars of value to that contract just to keep it and keep it relevant. And when I took this to my bosses at Intel and pointed this out, they said, what's the right thing to do? It's your decision, it's your business unit. We don't want to tell you how to run your business unit. They still call us Land Cloud inside Intel. We're the Land Cloud group, not HPDD. The, the moral of the story here is that Intel has, yes, acquired the team, but our team is acting as though we're an independent organization, doing the same things we did before. That's not to say that Intel's doing charity work here. Intel is getting into the software business, and we are required to hit sales goals and be a profit center for them. But Luster is on completely stable ground at this point. Some people ask, what's the difference between Oracle acquiring the Luster Group and Intel acquiring the Luster Group? Well, Oracle did not go to Sun and buy Luster. They had other technologies in mind, and they got Luster. Intel came after Minecraft to get Luster. So we are a member of the European Open File Systems Group, which is the Open File Systems Community Group in, in Europe. And we recently joined the OpenSFS as a promoter, which was another $500,000 that Intel put in to that community group. So enough about, about this group. Yes, all of this work is being done in Lustre. This is the roadmap for Lustre. We are on the verge right now of closing and committing to a 2.4 release. We generally want run two strains of releases. A maintenance release, if you're more of a trailing edge follower kind of a site, you'll use a much more stable release and not push the edge of the envelope. If you care about features, you'll keep up with us in the feature release strain. These are the list of, or the, the features that are going into the particular releases you'll see there. And we have a little legend at the bottom that tells you who's paying for each of these features. And in some cases, who's doing the features. There is a network request scheduling here somewhat of it. For example, Zyrotex is doing, and HSM is a feature that people have been waiting for for a long time, part of the storage management. That's going into the 2.4 release, and that was built mostly by the CEA, although we've, we've put our shoulders to the wheel quite a bit lately to make that happen. Two and a half years ago, when we started Glam Cloud, we committed to doing a feature release, the bottom line, once every six months, and a maintenance release every quarter, and we've held to that now for coming on 10 quarters. So we're pretty proud of the fact that the development team delivers on time and what we claim we're gonna deliver and add stability to the, to the work here. So on 
to the Fast Forward Challenge. In about May of last year, the USD and me published the Fast Forward Call, and it was specifically to accelerate technologies towards Exascale in three different areas, memory, CPU, and I.O. And it's run by a consortium of seven different DOE labs. The purpose here, because we were unable to get the congressional money that we wanted a few years ago to go after Exascale, the labs got a little bit of money and try it, they're trying to prime the pump in Exascale, specific areas that they think need a bit of a head start. So think of this as the on-ramp to Exascale funding in North America, which is separate from what's going on in Europe and Asia and all that. So they made three awards, CPU memory and I.O. WAM Cloud took all the money off the table for the I.O. portion and won this in collaboration with EMC, Cray, and the HDF group, not with BDM. <coughs> When we got to Intel and were required to no bake the contract over to Intel, Intel added money back on the table. We brought back in two groups. That was DDM, who's doing the version of OSD, and we brought in a group at Intel that's doing arbitrarily connected graph algorithms as an application driver for this. Okay, so these are the technology drivers. These are from the DOE in the specification for here's what we need to perform at for Exascale. I bolded the ones that are of interest to us. That is object create. These are metadata operations. So think of a file create operation as an object create operation. Today we're a little bit under 100,000 per second with the current luster standard, and we want to take that to 100 million per second. Peak IO bandwidth. There was a press release by Cray at Supercomputing that they are doing 1.1 terabytes per second to spin a disk on Lustre at the Blue Waters project. The DOE wants us to take that up by a factor of 100 to 200, to the peak rate of 100 to 200 terabytes a second. And then the sustained rate, which I'll get into in the cartoon, is going to be 10% of that. And so this is a list of other drivers, but these are the ones that, that we care about. What we see going on here is that a deposit file system, which has been beaten up a lot in the past 10 years, is finally going to go and have a secondary position in the I.O. streams at the extreme scale. So there's, a, there's an explosion of data, as everybody knows, but the data is more complicated as well, with pointers and relationships and so on. The, think of the POSIX file system like the flat filing system from yesteryear where it's difficult to get at your data and the new way of doing things much more like a database where you've got metadata that allows you to stride through your data in different dimensions. So you can ask an ad hoc question like where is that 100 year wave that we should be expecting in the climate modeling or a slice through the data vertically to get a temperature over the Hawaiian Islands and then horizontally to get to the, the temperature across the Pacific. That sort of thing. That's what we're trying to do here. The architecture that we propose to the DOE looks like this. We've got an exascale machine over here which will have some number of millions of, of cores. And if it's a straight MPI uh, job, it will have millions upon millions of MPI packs. Much like Cray does today, there'll be a set of I.O. nodes on the edge of the machine. And we're adding technology that we're calling burst buffer. That's a phrase that you may have heard if you've been hanging out in, uh, in uh, HPC circles. Burst buffer is something that, an idea that comes out of Los Alamos. So where we're doing the 200 terabytes a second is literally on the back plane or the interconnect of your HPC system. There's NV RAM on the I.O. nodes. So we've got a system where we've got some number of compute nodes that all proxy to an I.O. node. The blue gene way was 1,024 to 1. So there's a massive fan-in of clients to I.O. nodes. The I.O. nodes have NVRAM on them, which enables them to soak up small reads and writes much faster. Today, you can't drive bandwidth unless you use DDN's asking for 16 megabyte write chunks. With NVRAM on the side of your machine, you'll be able to gather up much smaller I.O., package that up into a bulk transport, and here's where you get the 20 terabytes a second. 
that goes across your machine room to the Lustre file system where there's, there's also a VRAM for going the other way and then finding the two disks. The stack looks like this. And I, here's where I should say we're working with the HDF5 group, which is a nonprofit near Chicago that rides herd of the HDF5 uh, format for data standard. We are no longer doing POSIX files, no longer stream of bytes. We're doing object storage semantics where the programming model will stipulate that the application programmer marks objects to be persistent and those objects will be stored persistently across machine lines. So our first object schema that we're going to work with is HDF5, but we're publishing the interface and making it so other object schemas can, can play here. So this is what's running on your compute node. The forwarding client will forward to these green I.O. nodes, where the Lustre client and the interface that we call DAOS, distributed, object, distributed, distributed application object store, will forward that to a Lustre file system on that end. The end result, the end goal that we're looking for, is to be able to put all of these data types in the same filing system. So today, we've got only POSIX strike files. But in a namespace that you're used to, a directory structure such as slash home, slash b, gorda, test, whatever, you'll be able to CD around your own directory structure and you'll be able to find files. So this would be a legacy file. This would be um, perhaps an HDF file. Once you find that file, if, if it's not a POSIX stream of bytes file, you would use the tools appropriate for that object schema today. So the people who use HDF as a file format carry around Python scripts. They drop into a Python shell and they do ls in that Python shell to inspect their data or to ask questions about it. And then finally, we've got designs on further out object definitions that are perhaps more aligned with, with business use. The last thing I want to talk about is epochs. And the simplest way to talk about this is if you take a look at the way we run HPC systems today, they're bulk synchronous. What it means is your application runs, all your processes hit a barrier, then they all write out their data files, if it's a checkpoint, for example. Then they hit another barrier, and then they all agree to start stepping forward and doing the next round of, of data creation or consumption. What we're creating here, and, and part of the magic, is we've got these lines called I.O. epochs. If you imagine your processes moving along in time across the horizontal axis, they can write their data, call that data of a certain genre, colors or letters or whatever, say this is genre red, pass the epoch and keep running and not have to be held up at a barrier waiting for the end of the compute or a barrier for the end of the I.O. The system will automatically tag all of your I.O. with these epochs, and when all of your processes have checked in, that epoch will be complete, and if you wish, prior epochs can be released and erased and, and recover the disk space. So this is a way of bringing more asynchronous behavior to your applications, and it's part of the research that we're doing for the Fast Forward project. I think that is it. And I'll take some questions if you have some.